Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Health Animated. On this podcast, we strive to make health information accessible to everyone. My name is Alex. And my name's Danielle. To our returning listeners, thanks for your ongoing support. And if you're new to our podcast, welcome. Today, we're going to talk about a health topic that has affected my life growing up, and perhaps even some of you guys out there who are listening, and that topic is acne. So Alex, did you know that 85% of people between the ages of 12 and 24 are affected by acne? I mean, I had a feeling that it would be a high percentage, but 85% is pretty insane. Yeah. I mean, I was the one that pulled that stat, and I still think it's mind-boggling. Because this affects so many people, we turned to our awesome family and friends and asked them what kind of questions they wanted to know about acne. And let me tell you, we got some really interesting questions. So I think we should just dive right in. So one of the questions we got was, does acne affect one's self-esteem? We looked at the research that's been done on this question, and we came across this recent review article titled, How Acne Bumps Cause the Blues. It was conducted in 2018. So this is a review article that looked at 13 different studies across 11 different countries. So the first theme identified was age. So this study found that the younger people were when they first started having acne, the more impacted their self-esteem. I think that tends to make sense, at least for me, looking back at my own kind of adolescence. I think, you know, being a teenager is hard and adding acne into the mix is definitely not easy. Yeah, I resonate with that statistic because I think when I first got acne, I was probably in grade 10 and it just went wild from there. And it definitely affected my self-esteem. Aw. Yeah, Alex, I think that's really important that you shared that. Um, One of the other themes that was identified by this study actually was about sex. So they found that women um, did tend to be more affected by acne uh, from a self-esteem perspective than men did. However, one of the studies also noted that there's been this increasing pressure for men to kind of adhere to these ridiculous beauty standards that society has put forward. Yeah, it's interesting how like societal pressures and pop culture really shape how young people view themselves in terms of beauty. There's a huge industry for for cosmetic surgeries, uh, elective cosmetic surgeries for women and also for men. And I think part of it is just that cultural shift and both men and women are depicted having this like perfect, nice skin with no blemishes. And I really think that it makes people think like that's the beauty standard. It's interesting because these studies, some of them were actually a lot older than I would have expected. So I think they spanned from like the late 90s until 2015, I think was the most recent one. So it is interesting how these themes have been kind of prevalent in society for like decades. But I do wonder how the severity has kind of increased over the years. And I don't know if we really kind of have the data to say that it has, but I would really speculate that it probably has over the last few years. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so that being said, the next kind of theme that was identified from this is not really that surprising, but they looked at the severity of acne. So they found that like moderate to severe acne actually had a correlation with a reduced quality of life and self-esteem. And that people with acne compared to people without acne had experienced more embarrassment and lower self-esteem than people that had uh, never had acne. So I think, you know, that's, it's not really that surprising just given the theme of the article, but I think that it's, it's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. The other theme that was identified is um, they looked at the percentage of people who actually sought treatment for their acne. And so what's interesting is that most people who suffer from acne actually don't seek medical treatment. Only about 5 to 28% saw a dermatologist. Most people tend to look for products themselves and try to self-manage their own acne. The other aspect that influenced how likely patients are to seek treatment was the severity of acne. So the more severe the acne, the more likely they're willing to seek treatment. 
Yeah, but I thought it was interesting, Alex, like with that article too, because they found that like the people that did seek medical treatment compared to those that didn't were actually more satisfied in how their like results were, right? And uh, they felt like they benefited from a self-esteem perspective, quality of life perspective, and had like less anxiety than those that didn't actually go out and seek treatment. So I think one of the main takeaways was to see your doctor. Yeah, no, absolutely. And just reflecting on my own experience with acne, especially in my younger days, uh, which wasn't too long ago, (laughs) I do remember just feeling embarrassed to even like go see my doctor. And I don't really know why, but like, I think one of the reasons was there's this idea that as a male, there's this perception that we shouldn't be prioritizing our skin because if we are to try to take care of our skin and look after it, then it's like a sign of like not being masculine. And so I think that was one of those like weird psychological barriers that I that I had. And I somehow convinced myself that I also wasn't worthy to see the doctor because to me, I felt like because this is such a superficial issue that there were other people with way more like serious medical conditions that are more deserving to see the doctor than some like young teenage boy who had acne. But it really did affect me when when you talked about, you know, how it affects your self-esteem and confidence and ability to like function uh, within a social environment. Like I felt all of that. Yeah, it just is such it's such an important reason to try to break those gender stereotypes, because I think that if we didn't have those, like, you know, you probably would have sought treatment earlier and like talked to your doctor about it and felt more comfortable. Yeah, I do hope that this generation will be a little bit better off in that respect. Although, you know, with all of social media, I think it's I think that they face uh, a different pressure that we never really would have experienced Something else that I thought was pretty interesting from that article and uh, pretty sad was the, the just the bullying aspect that people experienced when they had acne. So people with acne tended to actually experience taunting, bullying. Mm-hmm. The simple idea of perceiving that people are looking at you and giving you weird looks is also a really big factor in affecting one's self-esteem. Yeah. Yeah, you bring up a good point, Alex. And I think that something else to kind of note is that acne has been associated with higher rates of depression, anxiety, difficulties in school and in social settings, even with like suicidal ideation and suicide attempts. So I think that it is really important that we kind of shed light on this topic and that we, you know, tell people right now, like that it's okay to go and talk to your doctor about this and that there are people there that want to help to put together a treatment plan. So the next question we have is what causes acne? Okay, so the first thing is hyperkeratinization. So essentially that means that your skin cells are just sticking together more and that can cause some issues and we'll get to that. The next thing is increased sebum production. So sebum is this oil that is naturally produced from your skin. So the third factor is a bacteria that's called cutibacterium acne. So hyperkeratinization, so your stickiness of your cells, increased sebum production, and the bacteria kind of creates this perfect storm where these three things can just go up and clog that follicle. And that kind of creates the acne plug. The fourth factor that kind of produces acne is also inflammation. And that inflammation is related to the bacteria that are on your skin and that plug that's happened. So you've probably heard of the term as well, whiteheads and blackheads. Really, it just has to do with is that plug open or is it closed? It, and that depends on if it is clogging the whole follicle or if it's not. So that's kind of acne in a nutshell. So those four different factors that contribute. So when we're looking at how to treat acne, we want to look at managing those four factors. We'll get into that a little bit later. Okay, on to our next question. So ever since COVID, I've been breaking out around my jawline due to wearing a mask for long periods of time. What's going on? And I know, Danielle, you have firsthand experience with maskne being a healthcare provider in a hospital setting. Yeah, okay, so maskne is, yeah, definitely something that I've experienced uh, this pandemic. So for those of you that are not familiar with the term, it's kind of a hybrid of a mask 
and acne, thereby calling it maskne. So essentially what happens is you can get breakouts in the area that your mask is on. So a lot of people will actually notice it's kind of like in an O around your mouth and then some people can even get it kind of along their um, cheeks. So really wherever the mask is kind of touching. So maskne is actually a type of acne mechanica and as the name suggests, so mechanica, it Cause, it's caused by mechanical irritation. So really, what's causing this mechanical irritation? It's your mask. So usually, normally, when you have mechanical irritation, you want to try to remove the offending agent. But with masks, we cannot do that because they're very, very important right now during this pandemic. So what we can do is to try to manage uh, what type of mask we're choosing. Um, so I will get to that in a moment. But the other kind of factor with um, mask knee is the fact that you are wearing this mask all day and it's creating this humid environment underneath your mask. You probably notice that it feels a little bit kind of warm in there. So that humidity can actually cause your skin to swell up and it can clog your pores. And it can also lead to changes in the sebum production. So one of the four factors that causes acne. And it can also impact the bacteria that live in our skin. So it's kind of just a perfect storm for causing acne. But because masks are so, so important and we need them to stay safe right now during this pandemic, we need to figure out how do we kind of minimize this? So the first thing is to make sure that you're washing your mask daily. Uh, so treat your mask like your underwear and make sure that you wash it every day because that's kind of the key to making sure that we don't have this extra kind of bacteria kicking around, that there's um, kind of nothing else going on. And also just for good mask hygiene because we want to make sure that we don't have any virus particles on it, right? So the next thing we want to do is we want to try to minimize friction of the mask. So this can actually be done by making sure that the mask fits us really well. So when we're talking with the mask, we want to make sure that it's not moving around a whole lot because we don't want it to be kind of chafing against the skin and causing that mechanical irritation. And the third thing is just making sure that we choose a really good comfortable fabric. So Cotton is uh, kind of the fabric of choice right now from a protection standpoint. Cotton is also being recommended. The three layer cotton masks right now is what's being recommended in Canada. And uh, that is uh, important as well because it's a breathable fabric. But some people will still notice that their skin's really sensitive. So if that's if that's you and you're noticing that the cotton's kind of chafing up against your skin, you can also sew a silk lining inside the cotton mask. But don't go for a, a silk mask because they're not as effective against um, virus particles and that's really what you want to use the mask for. So yeah, I definitely have um, experienced mask knee at, uh, in the last few months and it just has to do with the fact that we're wearing masks all the time. So I've tried to also minimize kind of my, my makeup as well with that I'm wearing to work now. So I'm really just moisturizing and uh, not not uh, using a lot of other things that'll clog up my pores just because the masks are already already kind of doing that for me um okay so the next question that I am gonna ask for that came from our friends and family is and I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this just it being a pandemic and all people have noticed that when they're going through stress they tend to break out more and they're wondering why does this happen so when you go through those emotional highs and lows, there is the production of hormones such as glucocorticoids. And these hormones are known to worsen acne by increasing that sebum production. So that's the oily, waxy substance that is secreted onto our skin. And normally when it's secreted in a healthy amount, it's meant to moisturize and protect our skin. So it creates that barrier against microbes and other things in our external environment. But when stress levels are high, there is an overproduction of these hormones. And due to that increase, then it creates that perfect storm for a pimple to come up. That is a really good ex explanation. Okay, so the next one, I'm going to field over to Alex because I know that you like chocolate. And uh, I wanted to ask, is it true that eating chocolate can cause breakouts? Ooh, this one's such a controversial question. There's been so many studies on the role of diet. And what we've noticed is that there is really no conclusive answer of whether or not chocolate 
can cause breakouts. Some of these studies took it to other products as well, such as dairy products, and a lot of people have anecdotally reported that milk can lead to breakouts. So as I as I already mentioned, and I'll just re-emphasize, the evidence is actually inconclusive. However, what I do encourage people to do, and it's something that I think we do in our day-to-day practice, is that if you suspect that there's a certain food product that is triggering your acne, you can start by keeping a food journal or a food diary and see if you notice any patterns for yourself. Because everyone is different, but from a scientific point of view, we do believe that more research is required to really establish a clear link between nutrition and acne. But it never hurts to eat healthier, so if you can skip out on that chocolate and opt for that green salad, then by all means go for it. So the next question we have is, I tend to break out around my period. What's the deal with that? Yeah, so that's a really good question because I think that it's something that women just know is something that happens to us and it's just a fact but there isn't really a lot of evidence and data to support this so when we actually started kind of searching around this topic there wasn't a lot but we did find one study that actually looked at this and they surveyed women and they found that most women meaning 63 percent of these women that they surveyed actually did have a 25 percent increase in premenstrual inflammatory acne lesions so that's pretty interesting because it's a you know more of a quantitative measurement so you are correct ladies you can break out more or right before your period but you know even the mechanism of this isn't really fully known although you know there's very strong hypotheses and it's really has to do with the androgen effects on the sebum production which is that uh the the natural oil of the skin Okay, so the next question is, I'm dealing with acne, but I don't want to see my doctor about it because I don't want to waste their time and I'm embarrassed. Do you have any advice for me? First and foremost, I totally get where you're coming from because I went through that, especially when I, when I was a teenager. If you feel like it's impacting your life, then it's okay to seek medical treatment. And we've talked about this in, in at the very beginning, how acne can actually affect your self-esteem, It can cause an increase in anxiety. It can lead to depression. It can affect the way you interact with your friends. It's not just about treating your skin, but it's also about taking care of your mental health and improving that self-esteem and that confidence. So yeah, if there's anything I can can share with with our younger viewers out there is your, your skin is important. If you need a little tip, start by talking to your parents about it. Hopefully your parents will be able to advocate for you and and help you make that appointment to see the doctor. Because once you're able to see the doctor and get treatment, a lot of people will find that their self-esteem and confidence will improve as a result of being treated. So you are worth it. Yeah, couldn't have said it better. Okay, so Alex, I'm going to feel this next one over to you because you did the research for it. Okay. So how often should I be washing my face? So there's no black and white answer to this. Having said that though, you should definitely avoid overwashing your face because if you overwash your face, you're really going to get at the natural moisture barrier of your skin. And because of that, it can actually lead to more breakouts. And so logically speaking, it might make sense to like wash your face more often because you're getting rid of that dirt, the oils, the bacteria. But the reality is the oils that actually contribute to acne are actually located deep within those hair follicles. So even though it feels like you're removing those oils, you're actually not getting deep enough to get rid of that. So what the research has really shown is that washing a face twice a day is more than enough. Now, in terms of what products to use to wash your face, that's also really important. You want to make sure you choose cleansers that are soapless. An example of a soapless cleanser would be Cetaphil or CeraVe or even Spectrogel. And what you want to focus on is when you grab a product off the shelf, look for the word non-comedogenic. So non-comedogenic basically means that the product won't clog your pores. That's a really good tip. Okay, so the next one, should I be using a moisturizer even though I have oily skin? This is such a good question, and I'm just going to jump right into it. So the answer is yes. 
regardless of your skin type, you should definitely use a moisturizer. And this was one of the things that was so difficult for me to wrap my head around in the be- at the beginning because I'm like, okay, I naturally have oily skin. So why would I be supplementing my skin with like creamy moisturizers that just feel like it's just adding another layer onto my already oily prone skin? But it's actually really important to maintain that moisture barrier. So let me explain how this works. When your skin is dry, your body's gonna compensate by producing more oils. The sebum is a contributing factor to acne. So in order to break that cycle, you want to be able to supplement your skin with a moisturizer so then you're able to maintain that natural moisture barrier. That way your body, your skin, won't need to overcompensate by producing more oils, which then leads to the acne. This is how you can think about the purpose of moisturizers and the role of preventing acne. Okay, we're going to continue with these questions, but we're going to switch up the theme a little bit. We're now going to focus on different types of products to treat your acne, because we also got a lot of questions about that. The first question is, there's so many acne products to choose from at the pharmacy. Which ones would you recommend? Okay, so before we dive into that question, I just wanted to say that as a disclaimer, this podcast is not intended to replace professional medical advice. So please talk to your healthcare professional if you have any specific questions about these products and how they relate to your health. So what we're going to focus on, as Alex kind of alluded to in his question, is products that you can find at your local pharmacy. We're going to be focusing on mild to moderate acne. So if you have like moderate to severe acne, this is one of the cases where uh, starting with these products probably won't do too much for you. And it's better for you to go and talk to your doctor first before starting these products. So when you walk into the pharmacy, you're looking for a product to treat your acne. There is one product that has a lot of evidence behind it, and that's called benzoyl peroxide. So the way that this works is it actually helps to kill the bacteria, cutty bacterium. So in terms of strengths, it ranges anywhere from 2.5 all the way up to 10%. So what strengths should you be using? Well, studies show that a little goes a long way, and we would actually recommend 5% because the studies have actually found that it's just as effective as the higher concentration 10%, and it causes less irritation to the skin. From a side effect perspective, it can irritate the skin, and it can also stain and bleach your fabrics. So this is actually a really important one. When we were growing up, my mom can probably attest to the fact that we had a lot of bleached towels from washing our face after using benzoyl peroxide. So just something to note. So make sure that you kind of manage that with your towels and your pillowcases. From an effectiveness standpoint, people could actually start to see improvement within five days, but usually it takes about three months before you're going to start to see the full effect. And after that three-month period, you can actually see reduction in the number of acne lesions from anywhere between 21 to 52%, which is pretty impactful. So Alex, do you want to walk us through, if I have sensitive skin, how should I apply any kind of drug product, including benzoyl peroxide. There is a way to safely test a product to see if it's compatible with your skin. So if you're someone with sensitive skin, or if you're concerned about how a product might react with your skin, we encourage you to try what's called a test patch. Basically, a test patch is being able to apply the product to like a discrete area of your skin, such as your neck, the back of your neck, and to monitor it and to see if you have any negative reactions such as like extreme redness or burning or irritation. If you're able to do that, then you can know if you're able to safely apply it to the rest of your face. To apply benzoyl peroxide, what you want to do is you want to apply a thin layer to the affected areas. And let me explain what I mean by affected areas. So you might think that you should just treat the spots that are visible, the pimples that are visible, which for sure it will get at those pimples if you do spot treatment. However, what's more effective is if you actually recognize the zones on your face that are impacted by acne. So even though you may notice like areas of your skin that are clear, 
you still want to apply that medicated product to that zone if you know that that zone is prone to a breakout. So an example of a common zone is your T-zone area. So T-zone area refers to your forehead and the area that's sort of between your eyebrows and like closer towards your nose. Once you've applied the product for the very first time, you don't want to keep it on forever. So for benzoyl peroxide, you want to just leave it on for a couple of hours to start and then you want to wash it off before you go to bed. So this is going to be like a nighttime routine. And then gradually, as you start to tolerate the product, you want to increase the amount of time you leave it on for until you're able to leave it on overnight as this method gives your body the time it needs to adjust. If you're overly like aggressive or you're impatient like me sometimes, you might have a higher chance of experiencing the side effects, which includes like the redness, the dryness, the flakiness. Okay, so the next medication that we want to talk to you guys about is called adapalene. So this is a type of topical retinoid. And its brand name is actually called Differin. So you might have heard of the term retinoids, but what are they? Well, retinoids are a class of medications that are structurally related to vitamin A. And when these are applied topically, they can actually increase the turnover of your cells and therefore they prevent them from sticking together. So you remember that the stickiness of the skin cells that can contribute to acne is called hyperkeratinization. This class of medications can prevent hyperkeratinization. So the studies have actually shown that adapalene can reduce acne lesions anywhere between 33 and 64 percent after three months. So Typically, what people will do is they'll start off with benzoyl peroxide or adapalene. If they have not experienced benefit after three months, they'll either switch to the alternate product or they will try using those ones together. So some things to keep in mind when you're actually starting this product is that because it it works to increase the skin turnover, in the first week, you actually might see that your skin looks like it's worse. And why that is, is because essentially all of the acne is kind of being pushed up to the top of your skin. So you're going to see it more in that first week. So please do not be alarmed. Don't say, oh my gosh, this thing is the worst. It's not working at all. It just made it worse. That is actually normal. And that means it's working, even though that's very counterintuitive. So just bear with it and give it another week. So some common side effects that you might notice with this one is peeling, dryness, redness, and irritation. But similar to the benzoyl peroxide, this should go away after a week or two after your skin gets used to it. And the same thing as Alex described with the benzoyl peroxide, you can just start slow and just keep it on for a few hours and then kind of increase until it's on overnight. If you do notice though that you experience any of these side effects that they're just they're really irritating or they're not going away then do talk to your pharmacist or your doctor about it another side effect that people notice with this product is that it can make their skin more sensitive to the sun so sun sensitivity so it's really important that you make sure that you're putting on sunscreen with this product and wearing a hat and also it can also help to manage this by applying it at night similar to what alex said try that test patch if you're somebody that has sensitive skin it's just best practice really And the most important thing, though, is that it's actually not safe in pregnancy. So even though it's just being applied to the top layer of your skin, some of the product will still get absorbed into your bloodstream and it can actually um, be what's called teratogenic. So it can actually harm the fetus. Okay, so our next question is, I noticed that some of these products are available as creams, lotions or gels. How do I know which one to choose? So the form that it comes in is also known as the vehicle. So it's not driving a car, but it's about the formulation that it comes in. Topical products come in various forms such as creams, lotions, and gels. So how do you choose the right one? So as a rule of thumb, if you have oily skin, you want to choose something like solutions and gels as they are water-based and they won't contribute to pore blockage. If you have the opposite problem, say you have dry skin, you want to think about adding moisture to your skin. So you want to choose things like lotions or creams because they tend to be a bit more hydrating. And you might be wondering, like, is it really that important to choose the right vehicle? Like, shouldn't I just be focusing on like the active ingredient and that's all that matters? Well, this is actually really interesting for us to discover is that the research has actually shown that between 30 to 80% of the medication's efficacy might actually be due to the formulation rather than the active ingredients. Uh, The next question I want to throw back to Alex because I know, Alex, you've had a lot of people ask you this question when you worked in community, and that is, I have scars from my acne, and is there anything that I can do about them? 
If you're looking to self-manage your scars, the answer is no. There aren't any products that you can find off the shelf to effectively treat your scars. Having said that though, there are some other interventions that can be tried such as chemical peels and laser therapy. If we're looking purely at the evidence, it is a bit inconclusive and and the reality is there's an appetite for more research to be done in this area. So if you are someone that has a scar and you want to get rid of it, don't feel discouraged. You know, we encourage you to take that question to your doctor or your dermatologist because they are the experts that can help walk you through other types of treatments. You know, it's not to say that there's nothing out there at all, but it's really about considering all the other factors like how long have you had your scar for? How deep is your scar? How dark is your scar? How big is it? So that would really help to set the expectations on the type of outcome you might get from these other interventions. So the last question we have is, what are your thoughts about pimple patches? Well, this is very interesting because before we did this podcast, I had no thoughts about pimple patches because I didn't know about pimple patches. So if you're like me, why don't I explain what a pimple patch is? So these are small circular patches that typically contain hydrocolloid. And uh, hydrocolloid originally started off in in band-aids. So what they had noticed is that it would help to kind of improve the healing time of wounds. The whole proposed mechanism of using these pimple patches that are made of hydrocolloid is that that they just help to kind of absorb the fluid from the pimple. There was only one study that we could find, and it was a randomized double-blind trial of 20 patients that either use the patch or they just use tape. So I don't know how you can really blind for that unless that tape was very cushy tape. So they either use the patch or just tape. And then what they found was that after three to seven days, the people that use the pimple patch, the hydrocolloid patch, They actually had improved severity of the acne and inflammation. In summary, those pimple patches, they appear to be safe to use. They can help prevent you from like picking or scratching at your acne, which is can actually lead to scarring. So from that perspective, they are beneficial. But one thing that we do want to kind of caution you is just to read the ingredients in the product. We would actually suggest that you just use single entity hydrocolloid patches and not something that has other products in it because those other products could actually just further irritate your skin. But the hydrocolloid seems to be quite well tolerated and will just help to absorb the fluid from the pimple and help with healing. So those are all the questions we had about acne. Uh, We really hope you enjoyed this episode because we certainly had a lot of fun researching this topic and sharing with you what we found. If you enjoyed this episode, we really appreciate it if you can share this with your family and friends. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to this week's episode of Health Animated. We'll catch you guys next week. See you guys. Bye. Bye.